Our scripture comes from the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 12 to 19. Seeing this, Peter addressed the people, You Israelites, why are you amazed at this? Why are you staring at us as if we made him walk by our own power or piety? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus. This is the one you handed over and denied in Pilate's presence, even though he had already decided to release him. He rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you instead. You killed the author of life, the very one whom God raised from the dead. We are witnesses of this. His name itself has made this man strong. That is because of faith in Jesus' name. God has strengthened this man whom you see now and know. The faith that comes through Jesus gave him complete health right before your eyes. Brothers and sisters, I know you, you acted in ignorance. So did your rulers. But this is how God fulfilled what he foretold through all the prophets that his Christ should suffer. Change your hearts and lives. Turn back to God so that your sin may be wiped away. The word of the Lord. Christ won't mind if I borrow his table, at least for a moment. Just when you think you've kicked the cold, you get a cough and risk losing your voice, so go figure. I, I have a confession, or at least I feel a need to confess this morning. And that is that I struggle with my faith. I have struggled with my faith from the beginning. And I have struggled with it as recently as this weekend. I went to a, a wonderful mental health training for geared at dealing with mental health first aid for youth. And I heard, stated the statistic, I know it's not new and I've probably heard it before, but it felt new and it broke my heart fresh again that here in Washington State, for youth ages 10 to 14, the leading cause of death is suicide. And for youth aged 15 to 34, youth and young adults, the second leading cause of death is suicide. In the midst of learning skills to help cope and to work with folks who are struggling with mental illness, we have to be reminded just how dangerous, how deadly the prospect is and how great a risk we put our neighbors, our family, and ourselves in when we don't work to remove those stigmas that keep us quiet in the face of such a challenging and sometimes deadly disease. And where have we been? Where have we spoken? Have we said enough? What have we left undone? What have we done? I struggled. I went home and I struggled. And the previous night, Friday, when we began the training, I went to it, unaware of the news of the world around us and unable to be aware because the airstrikes began while I was at the class. So I found out as I was leaving and heading toward home that we had begun strikes in Syria, uh, beginning a launch of some 100 cruise missiles, uh, a retaliatory, punitive action for the uh, alleged and we assume 
evidence for chemical attack that took place the previous weekend, Saturday night, when we woke up on the way to church, hearing news that there was evidence that chemical weapons had been deployed by a nation against its own people. So this weekend, I struggled. Last weekend, I struggled. Going clear back to when I finally started to develop my own image and understanding of who I was as a person of faith, which is a story that goes clear back into those hallowed days of high school when I was invincible and I wouldn't have a cold holding me back like I do today. <sighs> my faith was not invincible. And surrounded by some of my more evangelical friends who were so firm, so grounded in their belief, if you just got right with Jesus, everything was good. Once you said your prayer and you made your peace, your sins were forgiven and all was okay. We'll tell that to a 16-year-old who then goes, well, what happens when I sin again tomorrow? What happens when I foul up the next day after that? Is my forgiveness still okay? Is it good? My friends weren't much help. I couldn't really talk to them. I'm grateful for the pastor in my life whom I finally came to and said, I struggle with this. I keep hearing that because I have prayed and said the right words, because I have reached out to God and felt God reach out to me, that I am good, but I don't always do things that are good. My heart hasn't changed as much as I had hoped it might have in that moment. Am I really okay? I struggled. I thank God for a minister who said, you know, I mess up too. I still do things I wish I wouldn't. I commit sins. I do wrong to other people. I raise my voice in anger. I, I do all of these things that I know I shouldn't. I still do them. And I said a prayer just like you did once. And I trust that God knows there is no point at which we are going to be able to heal ourselves. We have to trust that God will continue to be at work within us. He introduced me to a $5 seminary word that I'll share with you, sanctification. And he says it's a process, not a moment. It is an ongoing act, not a simple prayer. It is a struggle with your faith, with your God, with your sin to continue to find out how you will live as a follower of Jesus, how you will lead your life as one who has been forgiven by God and who continues to do things that need further forgiveness. How do we tell our story when we struggle? I think that's part of the problem. I think the other part of the problem is we get handed scripture readings that are only telling us part of a story and they're leaving out some of the key parts. <coughs> I don't want to speak for any of the rest of you all, so I'll just speak for myself. Well, I don't disagree with anything that Peter had to say in our reading that Howard shared with us today. It didn't inspire me that much. I already knew it all. I've heard this story before. I've heard these words before. It didn't jump out at me. It didn't speak to me. So I was starting to read around it, and I realized we're only obliquely hinting at part of what's going on. We're missing part of the story. So uh, I'm glad you hung around, Howard. Would you mind filling in the part at the beginning that we should have heard while we were sharing the scriptures today? Sure thing. We'll go back to the beginning to chapter Acts 3, verses 1 through 11, leading up to what I read. Peter and John are going up to the temple at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the established prayer time. Meanwhile, a man crippled since birth was being carried in. Every day, people would place him at the temple gate, known as the beautiful gate, so that he could ask for money from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he began to ask them for a gift. Peter and John stared at him. Peter said, look at us. So the man gazed at them, expecting to receive something from them. Peter said, I don't have any money, but I'll give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, 
Rise up and walk. Then he grasped the man's right hand and raised him up. At once, his feet and ankles became strong. Jumping up, he began to walk around. He entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. They recognized him as the same one who used to sit at the temple's beautiful gate asking for money. They were filled with amazement and surprise at what had happened to him. While the healed man clung to Peter and John, all the people rushed toward them at Solomon's porch, completely amazed. Seeing this, Peter addressed the people and began to preach that sermon read to you earlier. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Howard. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. I went back and I read that, and I realized it helped fill in the story, and it didn't make me feel any better at all. I have never had the strength of my convictions to reach down to someone who was wounded and pull them up and say, in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And I don't know that I ever will. And yet, in this story, we heard Peter beginning to tell the story of the early church. This is Acts chapter 3, right after Acts chapter 2. Everybody remember what Acts chapter 2 is? That's the Pentecost story, the tongues of fire dancing on the heads of the disciples, speaking and proclaiming the gospel in languages that all of the world could hear because all of the languages of the world were practically represented that morning. This is a story of Peter proclaiming how resurrection power is at work and alive in him, and if it is good for me, it can be good for you too. I have a story to tell to you. I have a story to proclaim to the nations. Now, if you're reading the title for this sermon, we're finally getting to the testimony part, the testifying part. Peter stood up and took the good news that had been shared with him and went out to proclaim it with others. <sighs> When is the last time I have preached anything outside of these walls? When is the last time any of us have preached anything outside of these walls? And are we even supposed to preach it? How do we get into a place where we can begin to offer our testimony of how God has been at work in us? Do we even fully yet know or understand? I struggled. I still struggle. Because some days I'm not entirely sure. I trust that God is at work with me, that God is present, that God is guiding me, but I'm not always sure. Jesus, fully human yet fully divine, you and me were just stuck with the fully human side of that. Sometimes we doubt. Sometimes we struggle. How do we share a story of good news when we're not even sure how to tell it to ourselves? And yet... Yet the discipline of a transforming church, of an evolving church, is a church of people who can tell their story of faith. It ain't easy when you struggle, though, is it? It ain't easy when we don't spend a lot of time working out what it means to hear the story of faith and to forget about the gospel according to Mark or Luke or Matthew and start telling the gospel according to Howard. The gospel according to Mary, the gospel according to Clint, the gospel according to Sandy. We could go down the room here. We all have a faith story to tell. It's not easy to tell, though, is it? It's not always easy to share. I loved the power in this story. I loved the conviction of Peter and the other disciples, you'll hear more about as you continue through Acts, who stepped out and were able to allow God to heal the world around them through their actions and through their proclamations. I love the way Peter proclaims that the gift of resurrection is alive in him. The power of God is at work with him and it can be for you too. Because it means it can be for me also. And the power and the promise of resurrection, not just on the other side of our death from this world, but right here in this present life now, is that God's grace is big enough to allow us to try again when we struggle. When we, as 16-year-olds, go to our pastor and go, I don't know about this whole saved thing because I don't feel very saved today. 
resurrection power is what allows us to step up, to recover from that, and continue to move forward. To hit that weekend, whereas the pastor has to come and deliver a good word to a congregation, you're hit with statistics about the dangers of mental illness in our youth and our children and just how deadly it is in the midst of word that we have launched yet another airstrike, that somehow we're going to cure a war by going to war. I struggled, but the power of resurrection is what allows me to get up again in the morning and come and stand here before you. I'm not very good at testimony. I'm better at preaching. They're not always the same. But I'm not very good at testimony. This is as close as you've probably ever heard me in this church. And it's because I struggle to even get up and offer you my story of faith. And here I am telling you, as a church, we ought to be thinking about how we all offer our stories of faith. So I'm going to wrap up this morning by going back to Peter's story of faith. That the power of God, that the promise of resurrection was at work in him. And he knew it. And he trusted that it could be at work in anyone and everyone. So if I can't stand on my testimony, let me this morning stand on his. That God has a story for us. We have a story for others. And we will find a way to embrace it and to own it and maybe even to tell it. I've spent a lot of time these last few sermons in this series ending it by asking you all, and I'm not there yet, this is rhetorical, by asking you all, amen? Maybe this one's a little tougher. Who wants to get up and give their testimony next week? Amen? <laughs> ah, from the voice of a child. While the rest of us, we adults, squeamed a little bit at that one, didn't we? But we have a story to tell. How we figure out how to tell it. Maybe we got to work on that. Maybe we need to struggle. But transforming churches, they find ways for all of us to tell their stories. Besides that, I know you'd get sick of hearing mine. But what if we started hearing ours? God has a story to tell. God has given us stories to tell. Are we ready to struggle with our faith? and figure out how we can proclaim good news? I hope we are. I hope we're willing to work at it. Maybe at least give it the good old try, right? Amen? Amen. Amen.